to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Hello and welcome to our book club. I'm Minnie Menon and today we take you back 150 years uh, to trace the journey and life of a very interesting man, John Lang, who actually chronicled a very, very interesting phase of Indian history. The story of John Lang and his works had completely vanished until they were resurrected uh, over a period of time. And joining us today is author Amit Ranjan, who spent about a decade trying to trace the story of this man. But why should we know about John Lang? Amit, thank you so much for joining us today. But I'm gonna to ask you a very simple thing. Why did you feel John Lang's story had to be resurrected? He had to be reintroduced to public memory. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Mini. Um, the simple answer to this question is um, that it's a calling um, that um, I was so taken in by the story um, that there was no other option uh, to do it. The um, academic um, answer to this uh, question would be that John Lang needs to be resurrected because of um, various reasons. First of all, to, in my understanding, um, he is a very important writer of the 19th century and a feminist writer, um, writing against the grain of Victorian literature. And many of his protagonists are um, female. Um, which we'll discuss um, by and by and very strong female characters and, and he goes against the grain of writing of the time. So that is one. And um, um, uh, he had a career as a lawyer, as a journalist and as a writer and all three careers are important. As a lawyer, um, he fought the case of Rani of Chansi um, and several other cases and uh, he, he primarily fought cases of Indians against the um, East India Company and this very famous case of Lala Jyoti Prasad where he fought against the East India Company and um, <clears throat> got damages um, for his client. He also constantly lampoons the legal and the judicial system uh, in, in British India at this uh, point of time. Um, and as a journalist, um, he's constantly anti-government. He also produces a lot of literature in his newspaper as was warned at that uh, particular point in time, serialized novels, etc. So um, he is a prolific uh, journalist and writer and also an important lawyer of the time. And uh, history needs to uh, resurrect him. And it's unfortunate that all the three nationalities to, to which he belonged, um, Australia, India, and England, is um, lost to all three uh, in, in today. Right. But uh, I want to talk about the case of Lala Jyoti Prasad, uh, 1851. Yeah which you've written very beautifully because uh, it's, it's a fascinating study of the man who uh, actually uh, takes on the judge in the court because he wants, he has a bet against that, right? So I want you to say it in your, your style, the way you have written. The episode of Lara Jyoti Prasad is uh, absolutely um, uh, fascinating. Um, so he was Lala, he was John Lang's client. Um, and what happened is Lala Jyoti Prasad supplied provisions to uh, East India Company for Anglo Sikh Wars um, between 1840 and 1845. And um, the East India Company owed him some 37 lakhs. So instead of paying him up, what they did was slap the case of forgery against him. And John Lang was the guarantor. And uh, apparently, some of John Lang's property was also confiscated. And this infuriated um, uh, Lang beyond redemption, let's say. Now, we do not know whether Lang was in India or whether he came from England to fight this case, but Lang being Lang to add color um, to his narrative, um, uh, said in the court that he had come aboard um, uh, the ship called Nile. Uh, so Lang came, let's let's assume that Lang, Lang came from England and he came from England aboard the ship called Nile and heard the prosecution uh, for a week um, and did not speak anything, let the prosecution speak, uh, he cooled his heels and thereafter he started speaking on the eighth day and then he completely held sway and, and sort of um, had the court under his um, spell. Uh, he was um, very good as a lawyer, one can imagine, 
and uh, he was able to refute all charges successfully and in the end um, get the damages were 37 lakh rupees in, in that day 1851 you can imagine um, for his client uh, Jyoti Prasad. Um, a day before the judgment was to be pronounced uh, there was a party and, and this is recounted in a soldier's writings in 1893 William Forbes Mitchell and he says that John Lang was um, no teetotaler and John Eckshaw was the leading brand of spirit uh, at that point of time and so John Lang inebriated on John Eckshaw was asked what he thought of the jury and Lang said promptly well I think the jury is a bunch of damned sewers pigs um, and, and so his friend said can you say this in the court and so a wager was laid for thousand rupees and in the next day in the court Lang said that he had come aboard the Noi, uh, Nile a ship um, and they were served uh, rotten pork on the ship and he pointed out to each jury member uh, mentioning one aspect of the case that this particular count on which Lala Jyoti Prasad has been um, charged of forgery etc uh, stinks like the hind leg of the, of the pig and so on and so forth so he had in the end pointed out to all jury members and called them pigs and won the case and the pet of thousand rupees. Um, so uh, Lala Jyoti Prasad was over the moon and, and gave him 10% uh, of, of uh, the damages which is roughly 3 lakh rupees and also a gold bucketed portrait of himself. Now um, uh, this was uh, Lang considered this his lucky charm and, and he carried this portrait with him wherever he went. And in 1857, when they were hunting for a picture of Nana Sai, Nana Sai being the villain of 1857 for the British uh, with the Kanpur massacre, uh, uh, nobody had seen Nana Sai, but it, it was famous that Lang had hobnobbed with all these royal figures in India. And so the journalist from Illustrated London News uh, went to Lang and saw this gold bucketed portrait of Lala Jyoti Prasad and uh, thought that this must be Nana. And he asked, asked Lang. And Lang says that he told him that the person in the portrait resembled uh, him as much as he resembled the queen. Um, and but but the journalist was sort of convinced that it is Nana Sahib's um, portrait, and so he carried it with him. And this is what was the illustration that was made was was printed in Illustrated London News. Lala Jyoti Prasad embellished with a sword, etc. And uh, so this became a hilarious joke in India. Um, and Lala Jyoti Prasad, who was already had been wanted twice, dead or alive, was afraid for his life again because the man in the picture looked like him. Nana's uh, followers were distraught that uh, their hero did not look anywhere near uh, what appeared to be a, a Lala, a Marbadi banker. Um, and, and Lang avoided meeting uh, Lala Jyoti Prasad uh, here on. And, and so uh, this is one of um, these anecdotes from, from the John Lang uh, legend. Right. But so, you know, this, this case is very significant because it was a big victory against the, the British East India Company. And this is what propelled the Rani of Jhansi, Lakshmi Bai, to, um, to actually uh, get John Lang as a, a lawyer. Now, yeah. on Live History India, uh, we did take an excerpt of John Lang's own book on the wanderings of India, where we uh, published the article of his meeting with uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai, which yes. is again very, very colorful. Uh, how much of that is truth, knowing John Lang, Lang's psyche, Amit? What do you make of it? Um, yeah, so um, John Lang, having succeeded in the Lada, Lala Jyoti Prasad case, uh, became uh, an overnight hero in, in North India and the upper provinces. Um, and they carried him uh, in a procession uh, after the victory and he became quite famous and, and the news reached the, the Rani of Jhansi uh, who summoned him to be her lawyer for the doctrine of uh, Lapse case. Now this was an error of judgment on the Rani's part because uh, uh, the British were determined to make Lang lose uh, any subsequent case that he was going to uh, fight. And so the case essentially was that um, uh, Lang, 
the Rani did not have a natural heir, that Damodar Rao was an adopted son. And Rani's contention was that uh, he had been given legal status even before the king had uh, died. And so there was no question of him not being the legal heir, whereas the East India Company's contention was that anybody who was not a biological son would, would uh, lose their kingdom to the East India Company. Now, um, Lang fought this case for the Rani and lost it very quickly uh, within a week because, uh, as, as I said, the East India Company was sort of determined to make him lose. If it had been any other lawyer, probably the case would have dragged on for a, a little bit. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of description that you just mentioned, uh, Lang's is the only description of, of the Rani of Chasi by um, a white writer, a contemporary white writer, where he describes um, her beauty and um, and claims that she uh, lifted the veil to let him have a look, etc. Which which may be an exaggeration on the part of Lang, but this is the only available sort of description of the Rani by by an English writer. And this has been often quoted without anybody knowing who. Uh, John Lang actually was. And uh, so uh, she gifted him her portrait as well as a lot of jewels, etc., which we do not know where they are now, um, since Lang's uh, second family, when he Margaret, married Margaret Wetter, um, that family migrated to Burma and, and then to England during the Second World War. So where Lang's property is, um, we do not know. And, and so Rani of Jhansi's portrait still remains a mystery. Right. Last question. I know uh, after spending a decade chasing John Lang, you must be very close to him in your mind. But if you were to uh, keep an arm's length distance, what do you think his legacy is? Or, I mean, is his legacy completely forgotten? Uh, so what I understand from this question, there are two parts of it. One is um, uh, keeping an arm's length and, um, and talking about his legacy and about whether his legacy exists or um, is forgotten. So to answer the second part first, his legacy is um, quite forgotten. And I already mentioned earlier that um, the critics of uh, his time dismissed him as a hospital bed novelist because he'd constantly write against um, the British and East India Company. So he never got good reviews. And, and so within 50 years of his death, let's say his, his novels slowly went out of circulation only a hundred years later that he's sort of being resurrected. There were very few people um, who were interested in Lang. Uh, there was a private scholar called John Earnshaw in the 1960s who um, wrote something about his childhood. So primarily he was interested in his Australian career. The Ruskin Bond had a couple of novels by Lang at his house, um, courtesy his father. And uh, he took a little interest, discovered his grave. Um, but he also did not pay much attention to uh, Lang's career. And then there was Victor Crittenden in Australia, again, uh, an independent private scholar, a librarian, who was trying to collect his works. So a sort of um, a deep engagement with his uh, legacy, both um, as, as a journalist and as a writer, uh, hasn't really happened. And, and when I started to work on this in about 2007, there were barely five or six people who knew about Lang. Now there's uh, much more because of subsequent um, um, interest. And so that's roughly the journey uh, of uh, John Lang's obscurity. But in terms of his legacy, as we have variously discussed, is his very important. Um, first, as a journalist, uh, uh, today's tabloid journalism sort of has roots, the kind of catchy titles and, uh, that Lang was capable of. And yet, it was not the tabloid journalism of today. It was, it was very... Um, serious the way he took on um, um, all wings of the government, whether it was legal or judicial or, uh, or the army. Um, and uh, also the literariness of his uh, newspaper is something to look at. And, and today's journalists can take a lesson or two from him and how uh, independent, uh, how a journalist should be and can be um, independent. As a novelist also, as we've um, discussed, um, um, he's um, sort of a proto-feminist figure, um, making women his um, main protagonists. And also um, he discuss, discusses caste, class, colonialism. And so there, there is, despite a very um, sort of um, a breezy narrative and, 
and staccato vocabulary, there's a very deep engagement with political issues of his time. And so uh, one would consider his intellectual legacy important and um, it should be um, reclaimed. And uh, it's, it's an irony that um, he was working within three territories of England, India, and Australia, and he's um, lost to all of them. Australia, because um, he was talking about uh, freedom of emancipists those who had descended uh, uh, from convict origins. Um, and so he didn't get good press over there. In England, obviously, he was rejected by the critics as already discussed because of his anti-British sentiment. And in India, because he was a colorful figure who um, bordered on alcoholism, picked up fights, um, had affairs, etc. And so that doesn't quite fit into the uh, sort of imagination of a nationalist figure. And, and so it's, it's important in terms of historiography also as to what kind of figures are claimed and reclaimed and what kind of figures are lost to obscurity um, and why. Um, 